Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, to this very full room. It's wonderful to see so many people here. Um, I hope we can accommodate everybody. Welcome to this uh, public lecture of the Andrei Sakharov Research Center and the Adamkus Library uh, by Edward Lucas. I don't think he needs much of an int introduction. He's well known to Lithuania, has lived here at the beginning of the 1990s, um, is well known as a journalist, political commentator, worked for The Economist as a senior editor, is now the uh, senior vice president of the Center for European Policy Analysis, an author of a number of books, uh, well known, uh, now 11 years old, uh, The New Cold War, which in a way is part of the theme that he will be talking about, and his latest is Cyberphobia. Um, as I said, he is not unknown to Lithuania, he actually speaks Lithuanian. <laughs> <laughs> and he will be back again in May when we have a two-day conference at the Majvides Library in, uh, in Vilnius, which is the conference from Cold War to Hybrid War, right? And those of you who are interested in this conference, I can recommend that you try to register as early as possible, because we will have only 120 seats there, and full is unfortunately full. It's a two-day conference, and Edward will be speaking there. So Edward, the floor is yours. I won't keep you any longer. Is there anybody who wants a seat? Um, we have one more. So if you'll forgive me, I, will, I think it will be more understandable for you and less effort for me if I talk English. Um, but I have enormous, um, the deep and happy ties to Lithuania. Lithuania was part of my life during the Cold War um, when I was taking part in demonstrations outside the Soviet embassy in London. My mother was writing letters for Amnesty International to Leonid Brezhnev on behalf of Lithuanian political prisoners back in the 1970s. I remember that very clearly. And I lived here um, from 1990 to 1994. I'm also particularly pleased to be in Kaunas. Um, the last time I was here, I was getting my honorary doctorate from the university. I'm sorry I didn't come in my academic robes, but um, I guess you all know what they look like. Um, and I'm also very happy that we're talking here um, in the rooms that show the Lithuanian um, community outside Lithuania, because I had a lot of dealings with them and such important episodes from the old Cold War um, displayed here in the exhibits. And I'm also I'm very happy that I'm here at the invitation of the Sakharov Center. And if you're not all of you familiar with the work of the Sakharov Center, I do really commend that to you very strongly. It's tremendously important that we don't lose sight of the debt that we owe to the human rights campaigners, particularly um, Andrei Dmitrievich Sakharov and his colleagues who fought such a lonely fight um, with us and for us. So my title today is The New Cold War and How to Win It. And so I want to start off just by looking a bit at what is the New Cold War. When I wrote the book in 2007, my publisher was a little bit worried. Actually, my Lithuanian publisher was not worried at all. He was, that was uh, uh, Bartos Lankos. Um, and my, uh, my, my friend, uh, uh, was asking me, please hurry up and write this book because it will sell very well in Lithuania. But my English publisher was nervous because he said this is a very provocative title. People are going to say it's very extreme. Um, we know there are some problems with Russia, but it is really, isn't it, an exaggeration to call it a new Cold War. And so I made very clear in the book, and I always like to make clear, that the new Cold War <coughs> is not the same as the old Cold War. Um, I'm old enough to remember the old Cold War quite clearly, and many of you will remember it, or your parents will remember it, or your grandparents will rem remember it. And that was a very sharp ideological confrontation, very clear divide between a totalitarian communist system 
on one side with claims to be a global ideology, the idea of proletarian internationalism as everywhere would be better off under Marxism, Leninism and the planned economy. And it was a very sharp military confrontation. You had pretty evenly matched forces on the e the Warsaw Pact on one side, NATO on the other. In fact, in some senses, the Warsaw Pact had the advantage. They had more troops, more conventional forces in Europe than NATO did. And I remember at times during the Cold War when we thought we were losing. Um, the idea that the Soviet bloc might actually win. So it was a clear military confrontation, it was an ideological confrontation, and it was a confrontation more or less of equals. The Soviet Union was a real superpower, big in terms of population, big in terms of ideological appeal, big in terms of its global reach. And of course all that has changed. The Soviet Union um, and Russia are incomparable in terms of everything except landmass. Russia is still the largest country in the world um, in terms of territory, and it's still a nuclear superpower in terms of nuclear weapons. But on everything else, it's far smaller. 140 million people. Well, there are countries in Southeast Asia like Vietnam and Indonesia who do far better than that in population terms. In terms of economy, again, it depends how you measure it, but Russia is somewhere around the size of Italy or Spain in terms of its national income. In terms of its conventional army, its conventional arsenal, it's incomparable. It barely has a blue water navy. There is one aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, not at the forefront of world naval technology, I think it would be fair to say. It has, when it goes to sea, or when it, it's now having a big refit, but it was the only flagship of any navy in the world, which whenever it went on manoeuvres, had to be accompanied by a tugboat in case it broke down and had to be towed back to port. And I once, I, when the Admiral Kuznetsov was off the coast of Syria with a Soviet flotilla, I phoned a friend of mine who works at the headquarters of the US Navy's Sixth Fleet, and I said to him, so the Russian Navy has turned up in the Mediterranean, it's off Syria, what are, you, what are you going to do about it? And he said, we're standing by to render any assistance that may be needed um, because it's not a serious naval power. Um, Russia is a serious military power only if you are a neighbouring country. Russia can invade countries so long as it can drive to them. Um, this is obviously not very nice if you are Ukrainian or Belarusian or Georgian or from one of the other countries <coughs> contiguous to Russia, but there is no ability to project force in large numbers all over the world. The United States can do that, basically nobody else can. So the threat is very different. But so is the position of the West, that during the Cold War, because we were scared, we paid attention. We worried. We worried about our ideological competitiveness. We needed to know that our system had to be better because we were constantly being attacked by Soviet propaganda who said that life was better in the Soviet Union. Now, we knew life was not better in the Soviet Union, but we worried. We worried about the potential for subversion. It was very important to make sure that trade unions didn't get infected with the communist virus. It was very important to make sure our welfare states worked. If you looked at West Germany, East Germany, we need to make sure West Germany was better. We worried about information. We knew there was a battle between their propaganda, their disinformation, and our information. So we paid attention to that. We worried about money. Not a huge amount, because there was not much opportunity for the Soviet bloc to get inside our economies. We didn't have big Soviet companies like Gazprom, now listed on our stock exchanges. We didn't have big um, Russian banks making loans in the West, we didn't have rich Russians living in the West. So there was not much um, in the way of trade and investment links between East and West, but insofar as there was, we certainly would keep an eye on it. And if, for example, a Soviet um, company tried to buy a television station, well, they wouldn't have got very far. We would say that's not, um, that's not going to happen. 
And since 1991, we have lost our ability largely, I think, or we, after that, we certainly <coughs> did lose, I think we're getting it back now, we lost our ability to <coughs> focus. We decided that Russia was not a threat. We decided that Russia was a democracy, Russia was a capitalist country, Russia was a great opportunity for trade and investment. And all over the West, but particularly I noticed this in my country, because that's where I come from, from Britain, we gave up on capabilities that we developed during the Cold War. We stopped worrying about propaganda, because we said we won the Cold War. What more is there to say? That chapter is over. So we started cutting back on things like the BBC Russian service, or Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, these things, because they weren't needed anymore. There's a free press in Russia. What can go wrong? No point in wasting our taxpayers' money on that sort of thing. We didn't worry at all about the idea of Russian money coming into our financial, economic, and political system. I remember the very first time I heard the Russian word offshoreka. Mm -hmm. It was about 1990. And I was quite worried by this. I thought, why are we allowing this money, which should have been made in Russia, it should probably stay in Russia, it should pay taxes in Russia, it might even invest in Russia. So why are we getting these offshoreki in Cyprus and the Isle of Man? And as they became more ambitious, the British Virgin Islands and other Caribbean and similar offshore financial centers. But we didn't worry about it. Nobody thought that was a political, um, political threat. Um, it was just a wonderful chance for our bankers and lawyers and accountants to make money. So we became complacent. We became ignorant. We forgot stuff. Um, we became lazy. And we became dull. And all this offered a chance for the people in Russia who didn't accept the end of the Soviet Union. Now, this, I think, is the fundamental, if you like, ideological difference um, between what one might <coughs> loosely call the West and what one would loosely call the East or the Russian um, dominated, or, um, do do dominated world. What happened in 1991? Now, if you're Lithuanian, there is absolutely no doubt what happened in 1991. You regained your independence. Many people, not only in Lithuania, but in Latvia and Estonia and other um, former captive nations, would say they, they remember very clearly those wonderful days in August, September 1991, when the Soviet occupation ended, you rejoined the United Nations. That was a great moment of national liberation. I certainly remember it very clearly. Um, I remember 1989 very clearly, when the same thing happened in the countries of Central Europe. And many Russians thought exactly the same thing. Don't forget, we had hundreds of thousands of Russians demonstrating against January the 13th, 1990. They filled the streets of Moscow in protest at what the Kremlin was doing. So many people after 1991 thought, that's great, that was our liberation as well. I always like the, um, on the masthead of the Russian newspaper, <coughs> Commerçant, there is a very nice little line, which has been printed there ever since they restarted in 1989. Um, it was a big business paper before 1917, restarted in 1979. And it says, Commerçant was not published between the years 1917 and 1989 for reasons out of the control of the editorial board. And I think that was a very nice way of looking at it, that something entirely abnormal had happened and you're getting back to normal. So people had very high hopes in 1991 that we were going to have friendly relations with the new democratic Russia. And Andrei Dmitrievich, if he had lived, would have thought exactly that. But unfortunately, that's not the way everybody thought about it. There are other people, Vladimir Putin being one of them, who saw 1991 as a catastrophe. In his words, a geopolitical catastrophe. Um, this was not a time when Russia was freed. It was a time when Russia was humiliated. And from that fundamental difference of opinion, I think, stems our problems. It's a bit like, and I'm, I use this analogy more with Western audiences to try and bring it home to them, it's a bit like if Germany, after 1945, had not really accepted the defeat of the Third Reich. 
imagine that Germany was run by people who thought that the Third Reich had many good things about it, that it was a technological and engineering superpower, um, rather like people say about the Soviet Union, yes, yes, the Gulag was very bad, but we did get a man into space, remember Sputnik. Now, if any German said, yes, but we invented the Volkswagen and we invented the Autobahn, that'd be crazy. No, nobody would say that. Not even a right-wing German politician would want to say that publicly. If someone said, well, yes, we, uh, we did some bad things to other countries, but on the other hand, you know, we were a real superpower. You know, look at the extent of Germany in 1941. That was something every German could feel proud of. Well, when Soviet people, Soviet nostalgists say that, they mean it. Some of you will know that song, I was born in the Soviet Union. Um, Russians still sing that. You don't get Germans singing a song saying, I was born in the Third Reich. Um, so this is, the, uh, this is the gulf. This is the real problem we have. Because Germany is able to be friends with both West Germany in the past and you, the Federal Republic now, is able to be friends with Poland, friends with the Netherlands, friends with France, friends with all the countries that it treated so badly under Hitler, because it's sorry. It not doesn't just say it's sorry, it's paid compensation. It understands that this was a terrible thing. Yes, it was terrible for Germany, but it was even more terrible um, for the people, um, for, 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 for the neighbours and for the Jews and the Sinti and Roma, Gypsies and so on. <coughs> so there's no doubt in Germany that this was bad, and that is unfortunately not the case in Russia. And so this is where the disagreement starts, because the first thing that you think if you are a Soviet nostalgist or somebody who thinks the Soviet Union was basically good, is you say, well, we lost stuff. We lost prestige. We lost our ability to influence world affairs. We lost territory. And that's where you get people like Putin saying that Ukraine is not a country. He said that to George Bush in 2008 after the Bucharest summit. He said it's not a country, not a strana, it's just a prostranstvo, just a, 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 a place, a territory. And from that comes the idea that Russia has the right, maybe even the duty, to interfere in other countries' affairs. We saw this well before the rise of Mr. Putin. We saw this back in the 90s. Some of you may remember the Karaganov Doctrine, that Russia has the duty to interfere in any country in which Russians or Russian speakers are living. I've always felt a bit nervous about this because I don't understand why Russian speaker is a political category. I'm a Russian speaker. Robert's a Russian speaker. I don't want the Kremlin to come protect my human rights. Not in Britain, not in Lithuania, not anywhere. But you invent this idea of the Russian speaker as a political category and then you say you have a duty to defend those people. It's actually very similar to the idea that Hitler had about the Volksdeutschen um, in Czechoslovakia and other places before the Second World War. And it's well worth reminding Russians, and particularly regime Russians, about the very unfortunate um, political history of this idea. So once you start interfering in neighboring countries, will you immediately run up against the international rules-based order, the post-1990 European security order? The whole idea of the inviolability of borders, the Paris Charter, the idea that human rights are universal, the right, the idea, the very fundamental idea, that countries have the right to make their own sovereign choice about their orientation. If you want to join the EU, if you want to join NATO, you have the right to try to do that. Now, it doesn't mean that the EU or NATO will necessarily let you in. Look at poor Georgia and Ukraine. Thank goodness that Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and the others joined, um, went, joined when they did. But that idea, the idea that countries have the right to choose, is absolutely fundamental to the way that Europe runs. And that means we have a head-on collision with the Russians, with the Kremlin, because the Kremlin fundamentally doesn't accept that. So that's the basis of the disagreement. And Russia, because the West is weak, has been in a position to do stuff about that. The fashionable term for this is hybrid war. And I don't like that. I have a big uh, prejudice against inventing new jargon when we have perfectly good old jargon. And if you look at the so-called new hybrid war, every element in that was there during the Soviet period. And we had names for it, like agitprop, for example. And I much prefer to use those sort of terms 
because it's better to see that this is rooted in Soviet. It's the modernized version of Soviet tactics rather than some new thing. And I'm particularly against the use of new jargon because it is, tends to be accompanied by a particular kind of arrogance and ignorance which you get in Western security, among Western security experts. And there's a very good name for this which appeared on Twitter just the other day in an article by the brilliant Kathy Young, and it's called Westsplaining. And Westsplaining, you're familiar with the idea of mansplaining, which is when a woman actually knows something that the man thinks he knows, and then the man tries to explain it to the woman and talks over it. But Westsplaining is when you have Western countries, particularly big Western countries, telling countries that know a lot about communism and the Soviet Empire and so on, telling them what to think. And a classic example of Westsplaining is to say that we have this very difficult new problem with Russia called hybrid warfare. And everything about that's wrong. It's not a new problem. It's new to people who weren't paying attention. And I remember back in the 1990s, when I was living here, your politicians, very important politicians, President Adamkus, as he came later, Mr. Landsbergis, um, Lennart Meri in Estonia, many others were all saying, watch out. Watch out, Russia's going in the wrong direction. We can't see where it's going to end up, but we see that there's a problem of repression, and decay of democracy at home, and the rise of the FSB and these things. And we also see that Russia is misbehaving abroad, not on the scale that it did later. But these, um, these problems were absolutely visible, particularly in countries like the Baltic States, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Ukraine, of course, and Russia itself. They were visible in the 90s. And your leaders, your thinkers, your security policy experts, you warned us. You came to the West and you warned us. Lennart Meri, the Estonian president, gave a brilliant speech in Hamburg in 1994, where he outlined why he was worried about Russia and why he was worried about the West's attitude to Russia. And interestingly, the Russian delegation, this was at a meeting of the conference of the Council of the Baltic Sea States, one of those many meaningless international organizations that we have. The, um, and the Russian delegation was so offended by this, they got up and walked out, demonstratively slamming the door behind them. Does anyone know who the leader of that Russian delegation was back in 1994? I'll give you a clue. He was a municipal official in St. Petersburg, responsible for foreign economic relations. Can anybody guess his name? Yes, you guessed right. He was Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, of whom we were to hear later on. So even he heard the warning. But we heard the warning, and we didn't listen. So it's not a new problem. It's not a new problem in its source, and it's not a new problem in its tactics. And we now see, all over Western Europe, North America, people being dragged out of retirement, people older than me, people in their 70s, their 80s, who know this stuff, because they dealt with it in the 60s, and the 70s and the 80s. And they're being brought back into government and said, uh, told, you know a thing or two about this. What's going on in their minds? How does this work? These are people from the intelligence, defense, security, foreign policy world. And they say, well, the people are younger, but the tactics are actually pretty similar. So what are the tactics? Well, there is a military dimension. People are walking out. I hope they're not walking out in protest. But the good news is there's some free seats there, so if someone who wants to sit wants to sit, the, uh, um, <coughs> please make yourselves comfortable. Four or five seats there. Well, as you know here in Lithuania, there is a military dimension to this. Um, it's not, I think, the most important part of it, but when the Baltic states joined NATO, there was an uncomfortable four-year period where Russia was rebuilding its capability and NATO wasn't doing anything about it. The top secret NATO committee, MC161, I think if you Google it, the only reference you'll find to this is actually in The Economist, but it's not actually that secret. This is the committee that draws up the threat assessment. It decides what is NATO worried about. And for years after 1991, MC161 MC was prohibited by the political leadership of NATO from including Russia in the threat assessment, because Russia's a threat, 
and you don't make plans to defend yourself against your friends. And because there was no mention of Russia in the threat assessment, there could be therefore no plans, because the first thing you do when you have your threat assessment is you make plans. And then you have plans and you start having exercises to see if the plans work, and that's the whole basis of how NATO does defence. So up to 2008, there were no plans to defend NATO member states from Russia. Poland made a big fuss about this, and because Poland's a big country, it was able to make a big fuss. Um, and they said, this is ridiculous. We see what's happening on the other side of the border. And NATO said, OK, we will make plans which will, on paper, be the plans to defend you from Belarus. Belarus is quite a bit smaller than Poland. Uh, maybe plans to develop you, to, to, to protect you from Belarus, which might be helped by another unnamed country. So Poland said, well, that's nice, but not very much actually happened. And it was only after 2008, and it was the Obama presidency that did this, we should always be grateful for that, that they said that Obama said to NATO, this is ridiculous. We have plans to defend Portugal. We have plans to defend Norway. But we don't have plans to defend the Baltic states. And so that changed. But it took some time. And we were really caught with our pants down in 2009, when Russia, to everyone's surprise, had very big military exercises um, in the southern one was called Zapad, which means west, Zapad 09, and then the northern one was called Ladoga. And these two exercises, nominally separate, happened at the same time. And the scenario was really scary. And I was talking to my friends who are military Russia watchers, and their jaws were going down like that, because the size of the exercise, the way the Russians were able to move large numbers of troops and equipment over long distances in short space of time, the aggressive scenario of the exercise which involved repelling a supposed NATO attack from the Baltic states and then stabilizing the situation by invading and occupying a strip of territory on the eastern border of the Baltic states. These exercises conducted in secret with not the usual the military attaches and other military observers from NATO countries being allowed to see. And then just to underline the point, at the end of this exercise, there was a nuclear weapons drill where they practiced nuking Warsaw. Well, that attracted attention in the West. And 10 years later, NATO is, um, has done, I would say, pretty much all the right things. It was late. Um, I wish they'd done it earlier. But if you look at the military picture now, it's pretty good. We have the German-led enhanced forward presence in, in, in Lithuania. We have the Canadians with some other countries in Latvia, and the Brits and some other countries in Estonia, the, the Americans mainly in Poland, but actually all over the place. So I think it would be fair to say that from a military point of view, this is the safest that Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland have ever been. This is a kind of golden age. We have more troops coming in all the time. Congress is splurging money on European, on the EDI, the European Defence Initiative. Um, we have lots of exercises. Trident Juncture was the biggest NATO exercise since the end of the Cold War. And we have all sorts of other things going, going on. Again, new things happening all the time. So that's pretty good. That was, when I wrote the new Cold War in 2008, I was really worried about the military dimension, I'm not worried about it now. And of course there's a paradox that Russia doesn't like this outcome. Russia complains all the time. Why have we got NATO troops on our borders, they say. Why are Sweden and Finland, that's another bit of the picture, Sweden and Finland with unprecedented close cooperation between Sweden and Finland, close cooperation with the United States, close cooperation with NATO. In fact, I would say that Sweden and Finland are closer to NATO than many countries that are actually in NATO. I hope nobody here is from Bulgaria. I don't need to be personally offensive about Bulgaria, but actually in terms of the way that NATO works, Sweden and Finland are much closer to the decision making um, than the Bulgarians. And Russia hates this, but I would say to the Russians, I'm sorry, you only have yourself to blame. If you hadn't done all this stuff, we would still be in the position we were in 2006, 2007. Um, but the lesson of this is that if you try and bully your neighbours with exercises and airspace intrusions and all the other things that Russia does, well, in the end, they get 
worried and their friends get worried and they get together and they do stuff. So for us in NATO, things are pretty good. Less good if you're Ukrainian, less good if you're Georgian. Um, I worry about that quite a lot. But I think that given that Russia is fundamentally a militarily weak country anyway, and given that NATO is now back in business doing territorial defense, it's a good idea not to pursue our worries on that. You can always ask for more. The trouble is if you always ask for more, you'll eventually not get it. And then people will say, why didn't you get more? Maybe your friends don't really care about you. I would draw pretty much a line underneath the military stuff and say that is job done. But of course, there's many other things that Russia does, which are, I think are more difficult and more dangerous. Because fundamentally, and this is a very big point about the way the Soviet Union used to operate and the way that Russia operates now. You don't need to invade a country if you can subdue it politically. And to subdue it politically, there are all sorts of things you can do to bring pressure to bear on the decision makers. You can intimidate. You can make them think it's hopeless. Everyone in Lithuania knows what that feels like from 1940. You can bribe them, just pay them money. That works pretty well. Um, you can use economic leverage. You can make them feel their country faces um, bankruptcy or poverty if you don't cooperate. Um, you can use subversion. You can support some sort of um, fifth column. There are all sorts of tactics you can apply to weaken and confuse decision makers. And the good thing about those tactics is that they are often deniable, so you don't run into the same sort of trouble you do with the conventional invasion, and they're a lot cheaper. And that is where we see Russia putting its efforts into these, what you might call, non-military tactics. Some of them are still what one might call kinetic. They involve force. I come from Britain, where we had a Russian assassination attempt on a a uh, former Russian intelligence officer called Sergei Skripal, who worked for the British intelligence and was living in retirement in Salisbury and was doing some consulting work for other Western intelligence and the Russians didn't like that and they tried to kill him. They didn't succeed in killing him, they didn't succeed in killing his daughter, um, but they were careless with the poison and somebody else got killed. Uh, but there are other examples, Mr. Le Alexander Litvinenko, a defector from Russia's FSB, who was a specialist in the overseas criminal operations um, involving the FSB, particularly in Spain. This goes very close to the personal interests of the people at the top of Russia. And he was poisoned with polonium. Um, but there are many other examples as well of physical intimidation of opponents. There's the cyber dimension. We saw that very clearly in 2007 in Estonia. Um, one of the episodes that began to catch Western attention, the first state-on-state -state cyber attack. Now, it wasn't actually a very big deal in retrospect. The Estonians survived it pretty well. Um, nobody died. Um, the power grid stayed up. The mobile phone system mostly stayed up. Um, we learned quite a lot about how to, um, how to, how to cope with these things. Um, but we've seen many more cyber attacks since. We saw a really big cyber attack on Ukraine. In fact, we've seen repeated cyber attacks on Ukraine including ones aimed at taking down the power grid. And so on. Russia has real capabilities there. Um, it's not clear, I think, on our side yet how we respond to cyber attacks. Do we respond with cyber attacks of our own? What level of attribution do we need? How certain do we have to be that that attack came from Russia and not from China or some other adversary? And then what do we do about it? I'll get onto these questions a bit later on, but our own thinking about deterrence doesn't really work when you have these new threats. And then there's all the um, other tactics, the use of money, the use of energy as a weapon, the use, the abuse of the legal system. I wrote a piece about this, which you can Google, called the Toxic 20, and I listed 20 tactics that Russia uses. Only one of them is military, um, all the others are non-military. And after I wrote it, I gave this speech at a NATO conference, and people wrote and immediately suggested four or five other things that I hadn't, um, that I hadn't, um, I hadn't uh, included. So I won't list all 20 now. You can um, Google it. I think it was even translated into, um, into Lithuanian. But I'll just highlight a, a couple. One is the abuse of the legal system. 
Uh, Russia's got really good at using the legal system to silence its critics. The, uh, if you live in Britain, you are worried about libel suits. I worked many years for The Economist, and we wrote an article, it wasn't by me, um, but I agreed with it, about one of Putin's best friends, a man who, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to mention in public because that was a condition of the legal settlement, but I can tell you his Kremlin nickname is Kashir. Um, and we wrote, I think, a <coughs> truthful article saying that he had he'd become rich thanks to his friendship with Mr. Putin. And he sued. He said, you're implying that I'm corrupt. And under English law, if you say someone's corrupt, that damages their reputation, and then you have to prove that you're right. He doesn't have to prove he's not corrupt. We have to prove he's corrupt. And he, he was also suing us, not just for an apology, but for damages, he was asking for 20 million pounds. Because he said that was what the damage to his reputation had cost, me, had cost him. Now, The Economist is a big, rich, gutsy publication, and we can afford to fight these sort of cases. So we didn't apologize. Luckily, we have insurance. It's a very interesting thing. You can insure yourself against libel, um, libel cases. And our insurer said we are, in, you, we are insured for up to... I think five million pounds in legal fees and other costs. The other costs was very important. So I was able to spend the insurer's money. Many of you will know the Russian word kompromat. So I was able to get kompromat on this guy and I was able to find, thanks to a brilliant lawyer, a way we could introduce this kompromat into our legal defence at the last minute. And he suddenly realised that if this court case went ahead, all this stuff that he'd been doing was going to be out there in court and everybody would know about it. And so at the last minute, just as the court case was starting, his lawyer said, actually, can we have a little postponement? And we'll settle. We'll settle for a not, just, not even an apology. We don't want costs, we don't want damages. We'll just settle for an expression of regret. Sorry if we hurt your feelings, sort of thing. <laughs> and so we settled for that, but I still can't mention this man's name because we also said that no one from the Economist would refer to the case in, in public, so you'll have to Google it. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a good example of how you can use the law as a weapon. Because most news organisations, faced with a Russian, a threat from a Russian who has basically unlimited money, think, actually, you know what? Better if we don't publish that story. Take it down from the web. Apologize. So that's just one element of the um, Kremlin's tactics to try and silence the critics. You're all familiar in Lithuania with the use of energy as a weapon. You have the blockades. Um, I remember living here wearing my skiing clothes inside the house um, because the energy, with the, the, the heating had been, had been cut off. Um, you've also done very good things in Lithuania to get out of that. You've built the LNG terminal. We built the oil terminal back in the 90s at Bottinge, um, and the rest of Europe is beginning to catch up, not for the first time, to catch up with, um, with, 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 with Lithuania. But we're still vulnerable, much less vulnerable than we were, but we're still vulnerable um, to the, the temptation of a Russian energy deal. We see it in Bulgaria, we see it with Nord Stream, Nord Stream 2. But the thing that worries about most is not these sort of crude carrots and sticks. It's the Kremlin's ability to play divide and rule. And they're really good at this. When they look at our societies, they look for divisions. They look for divisions between countries, divisions <coughs> between the Americans and the Europeans, divisions between the North Europeans and the South Europeans, or the East Europeans and the West Europeans. They look for divisions inside our countries whether those divisions are ethnic, religious, linguistic, demographic, social, economic, political, you name it. If there's a, there's a division, the Kremlin starts thinking, how can we exploit this? They don't particularly want one side or the other to win. What they want is a dis, as debilitating, disabling polarization. And we've seen this really clearly in the United States. My best examples come from there, although there are many others. Where you saw the Russian trolls from the Internet Research Agency diving in to domestic American debates on both sides. 
So if you look at Kate Starbird's <coughs> analysis of the Blue Lives Matter, Matter, Black Lives Matter, she was able to prove that you had the Russian trolls on both sides. You know the Black Lives Matter complaining about police brutality, the Blue Lives Matter saying, yes, but what about all the police who get shot in the line of duty? It's a very polarizing issue in America. From outside, one might say both sides have a point, but in America it tends to be pretty divisive. And so you saw the Russians just piling in, promoting the Blue Lives Matter, saying poor policemen, black people are very dangerous, no wonder they have to shoot, the police have to shoot back. Promoting the Black Lives Matter, police are thugs, you just get shot for walking, walking down the street. But the message on both sides was the same, don't trust the system. The system doesn't protect you if you're a police officer, the system doesn't protect you if you're black. So the aim of this is to corrode trust. Trust is what holds our societies together. We need to trust other people. We need to trust, to some extent, our political opponents. We have to accept that we're all playing by the rules of the same game. We have to trust our political, our, our political institutions, our legal institutions, all the things that hold our countries together. That's what makes our system stronger than the Russian system. And that's why the fundamental weapon in the new Cold War, I reckon, is to attack trust. It doesn't matter who comes out on top and who loses. The key thing is at the end of it, people should trust the system less. So how are we doing in the face of this? I've outlined, I think, what the new Cold War is, and now I'm going to give you some thoughts about how to win it, and then maybe we can take some questions. Well, I think it's not bad, actually. I've already mentioned NATO. NATO has fundamentally solved the 2009 problem. That's pretty good. The EU has woken up. I remember going into the German economics ministry in about 2004 and saying to them, I'm really worried about the way that Germany is dependent on Russian gas. They almost couldn't understand what I was saying. They said, what do you mean? It was as if I'd said to them, you're dependent on British soap. Yeah, they've got it, we want it, we have money, we give it to them, they send us soap. We need gas, we give them money, they send us gas. But what do you mean dependent? And I tried to explain pipeline dependency and monopolies and the way that the Russians use the intermediary companies, these trading companies, in order to put money into the political system. But they were very interested. They literally laughed at me. They said, are you really saying, Herr Lucas, are you really saying that Russia would use gas as a political weapon? And I said, yes, duh. Because <laughs> I'd seen it. I'd seen it happen in other countries, the Germans had seen it. Well, that's changed. It's changed completely. It actually changed under a German commissioner, Commissioner Ertinger. He pushed through the third energy package, which unbundled. Gazprom's corrupt, exploitative, vertically integrated gas monopoly. And a big shout out to Lithuania and the Kabilis government, because you were the first people to make that happen in Lithuania, and you paid a big price for it, but it was well worth doing. And all of Europe, um, it should be grateful to Lithuania for that. We've since seen since then the Competition Commission going after Gazprom for its differential pricing. I'm sorry about Brexit, because I feel that we, this exemplifies the way the EU is a security organisation, perhaps more than anything else. It's a collective economic security organisation. And I'm sorry that we're weakening it by leaving. But we've stood up pretty well to Russia on energy. We're also getting the hang of disinformation. We have a... Um, I remember being laughed at only in 2010, I think it was. I was in the Ministry of Defence the big fat man who came to be the head of information for the MOD said, you really say that Russia would use information against the United Kingdom, against our political system? I said, uh, yes. <laughs> and we saw it happen during the Brexit campaign. We saw Russian money, Russian trolls, Russian social media posts going into and in trying to influence the result of the election. Now, I'm not saying it was decisive, but we certainly saw it happen. But we're waking up to that. We have a parliamentary committee which has done fantastic reports into state-sponsored foreign disinformation. We have taxpayers' money going into counter-disinformation efforts. In the EU, we have the EU's own um, external action service disinformation monitor. So I think we pretty much get um, the idea that disinformation is a problem and we need to do something about it. I think on other things, we're still way behind. We have not got to grips with dirty money. 
And the problem with that is there's a great industry which lives off, generally, off dirty money. Bankers, lawyers, and accountants. And they don't care where the money comes from, whether it's cocaine money from South America, whether it's Chinese money from Chinese communists who want to get their money out quick, whether it's from Russians, whether it's from, it could be from anyone. But they're really good at setting up offshore companies, setting up bank accounts, and then getting the money into um, investments, um, safely disguised investments in our economic system. And Russia exploits that. It uses it as part of its influence operations. And it's proving really difficult to deal with. One of the reasons is that Luxembourg, which is a big problem here, is um, the country which Jean-Claude Juncker comes from. So although I think many good things about what the EU is doing, there seems to be a bit of a block about doing anything that um, annoys Luxembourg. In my country, Britain, the city of London is very powerful. The city of London loves offshore money. And we are seeing a very frustratingly slow progress on reform of our financial system, and particularly <coughs> making it mandatory to explain who the beneficial owner is of a company. This, to me, is absolutely fundamental. If there's a company, I want to know who owns it. When companies were set up in the 18th and 19th centuries, they were there to spread risk. So if, you, if your business went wrong, you didn't go bankrupt. Nobody has ever said that the main advantage or an advantage of a limited liability company is that you can conceal who you are, that you can hide. That's just sort of crept up. And now everyone says it's normal. Well, I think it's normal. And we need to deal with that. So I think money is the, um, is, is the biggest is the biggest weakness, and it's the big Achilles heel of the West, and it's something that Russia is using against us and other countries as well. But there are other things that I worry about as well, um, which I would call the next generation threats. We've got quite good at working out what has been happening. It's a bit like driving a car, where you're looking in the mirror, and you say, oh, I see, I just drove over a pothole. Well, I just drove past the address I was heading for. Looking, <coughs> looking in the mirror is useful. You can learn from your mistakes. But on the whole, if I'm in a car, I like to have the driver looking through the windscreen at what's coming towards us. And that is still much more of a problem. We are not good at working out what Russia does next. It's partly because we don't invest in enough, we don't invest enough in our Russia watching <coughs> capabilities. But it's also, I think, because we're still complacent. We just think that we don't have to do very much, but we'll just do it and then get back to other things. I just want to mention a couple of um, what I think are, are the big next generation threats. One of them is deep fakes. <coughs> I don't know what deep fakes are. In Lithuanian, I suspect it's probably one deep fakus and two deep fake, but there may be a Lithuanian word for it. But anyway, deep fakes are audio and video material which are computer generated to look like the real thing. <coughs> now, we're all familiar <coughs> with this from watching Hollywood films. When they made The Lord of the Rings, they didn't really have eagles carrying people, they didn't really have millions of orcs and trolls and things like that. You generate them on a computer. So we're used to that. But just imagine that that technology. Yeah. Just imagine that technology isn't the province. <coughs> that technology is not only confined to industrial light and magic or some enormous Hollywood studio. Imagine you can do that easily and cheaply on a laptop or even on a phone. Now, we're kind of used to this with Photoshop, you know, and there's other apps as well. You can take a photo, I can take a photo of Robert, and I can make him look happy. <laughs> like that, but without telling me, I press a button, I put a smile, to make him look sad. But we're kind of familiar with that. But now imagine that you can make a video. You can make a video where Robert, or me, or President Adamkus, or anyone else you like, alive or dead, is saying or doing things that they never actually did or said. You can literally do this. You record someone on video, you have some audio of the, their voice, <coughs> you put it into the software, and then you type words and they end up saying it. The best thing to do you can watch on YouTube and it's Obama. It looks like Obama, it sounds like Obama, it's a speech that Obama never gave. And the cost of this technology is collapsing. So this is going to be a real problem. 
um, in many ways, it's going to be a real problem in the hands of hostile states. Um, I'm worried about artificial intelligence and the way Russia and also China can use artificial intelligence to attack our political systems. What happens if you are not just seeing adverts, but you're getting phone calls or text messages from robots, but robots that seem to be like human beings, sending you stuff saying, hey, I thought you'd like to see this, texting backwards and forwards, getting you into conversation, messaging you on Facebook, and you think this is real, they behave just like humans. They may even sound just like humans, but actually um, it's robots. So these are two forward-looking problems that I, I, I worry about. I think we haven't got um, our resilience and our deterrence quite right. We are better than we were, but here I want to say we really need to learn from Lithuania. You are world class when it comes to this. I think Lithuanians often don't realize how good, um, how, 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 how much your country has achieved on this. Your use of reservists, the Rifleman's Union, your ability to visualize Russian information warfare and country, this brilliant media initiative called Demask, Demaskwok. It's really, really good. And I, you, you were, you, Lithuanians are sort of are always surprised by this. I've seen meetings in London where your guys come, and there are meetings bigger than this, entirely full of senior British and other NATO countries, security officials, and they're all taking notes as fast as they can. This is the opposite of West Splaining. This is East Splaining. And it's really good. I'm in favour of it. Um, so you've got real capabilities in terms of dealing with uh, resilience, but we need to learn from you. We need to build security cultures. Um, the Estonians are very good at this as well, and the Finns as well. The Finns have things called national defence courses, where every month they get 20 or 30 people in leadership roles, in business, academia, civil society, outside government, and they put them through pretty much the same course that you would do if you're going to be a senior staff officer or senior official in Finnish um, defence or intelligence or something like that. Understanding how the country works, understanding what the threats are, understanding how to respond to them, networking with other people. So we need to learn a lot from you and from other countries about how to stand up to these sort of these threats, to learn resilience. Um, I, I don't like the phrase frontline states anymore. We used to have this phrase frontline states that you know, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, they're the frontline states because they're next to Russia. I don't agree with that at all. Frontline states implies you're the ones that are in danger and we're the ones that are safe. Well, my wife's Italian and I tell you, I feel Italy is a frontline state. Italy is the one that wants to end sanctions against Russia. Italy is the one that is joining the Belt and Road Initiative and is falling into the Chinese pocket. I would argue that America is a frontline state. We've seen Russian influence deployed in American politics to far more effect than it's been deployed in Estonian, Latvian, or Lithuanian politics. That's the sort of places we should worry about. So resilience, and particularly resilience in what we might call the Old West. And then finally, and then there's deterrence. Now, obviously, it's difficult for Lithuania, a country of three million people, to have a deterrent. But we need to think, what is our deterrent? We need to rethink that. Because it's not much help having nuclear weapons when you have something happening like the assassination in Salisbury. It's not much help having nuclear weapons when someone attacks you using social media. It's not much help having nuclear weapons when someone attacks you through your legal system or through stoking domestic subversion. All these other things that, 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 that Russia does. So I'm in favour of nuclear weapons. If Russia has them, I want the West to have them too, and I want Britain to have them, and I'm glad we've got them. And I, to some extent, I wish we had more of them. Um, but they're only a very partial answer. We need other forms of deterrence. Some of that is going to be military deterrence. So Finland, for example, has bought the first country in Europe to get the JASM missile. It's very interesting. The Finns don't talk about it. It's not actually secret, but you will not find a single picture of the JASM missile on a Finnish warplane. There's a press release, the Finns issued, where they bought that. And there are two pictures on the um, press release which show a JASM missile, air launched JASM missile, about to hit its target. These are pictures from America. It's very interesting, the choice of pictures. They could have chosen any pictures they wanted. And the two pictures they chose show the JASM missile hitting a target, one of which looks exactly like an Iskander launch pad, 
and the other one looks exactly like an S400. Message sent, message received, I suspect. But that's the finished deterrent. The Poles have bought the same missile. But we need to think about other sorts of military deterrents, sub-nuclear, non-nuclear, um, sub-strategic um, deterrents, and how we use them. How do we communicate to the Russians, we've got this, and if you attack us, we'll use you. And I think more importantly, we need to think about non-military deterrents. The biggest weakness the Kremlin has is that we've got their money. We've got their money. They invest, they steal money in Russia. They don't invest it in Donbass or in the booming economy of South Ossetia or Abkhazia or brotherly Tajikistan or Belarus. No, they invest it. Oh, God. I was talking about energy attacks. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. It's okay. One more. One more. One more. Yeah, yeah. That's resilience, you see. Resilience is when something happens, you know what to do. Um, so we need to really worry about, to think about how do, what do we do about making the Russians feel scared about their money. Now, the Americans have got this brilliant plan. It's just started under the Obama administration, which is to do financial snap exercises. Now, you'll be familiar with Russian snap exercises. Russian snap exercises are military. And what they do is at 3 o'clock in the morning, Suddenly, troops pour out of their barracks in Belarus or Kaliningrad or both, and you see everything going on to high alert. They load ammunition up, and they go off and they drive around. They maybe even drive straight towards the Polish border, or towards the Lithuanian border, or to the Latvian border, or wherever. And so, you know, all over Western Europe, people get woken up in the middle of the night, lights come on, people have to go to work, what's going on, get the satellites, point the satellites down, try and find out possibly even phone up the Russian military of defence and say, sorry, are you having an exercise? Would like to tell us about it? And usually, in fact, in every occasion, 24 hours later, everyone's gone back. It's just the Russians showing we can get 10,000 troops armed up and ready into the field in four hours. What can you do? So it's a nerve, it's, a, it's part of the war on nerves. And so what the um, Obama administration thought was, why don't we do that financially? Let's have a test and see what can we do in 24 hours to seize and freeze, freeze and seize, Russian assets. Now they only did it just in North America. What, how quickly could we identify? Say the president says, little green men have just crossed the border into Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. It's too early. You know, NATO is getting going, that's going to take you know, 72 hours, maybe even a week. What can we do right now to tell the Russians to stop it? You've just had that order from the White House. You're the guy in charge of sanctions at US Treasury. You've got your friend from the State Department there, FBI there, CIA there. Go. What can you do in 24 hours? Do you have the accounts, the real estate? Do you have the legal means to freeze it? What can you actually do? And then you walk in and you say, actually, this was a big obstacle. That bit worked very well. And then you do it again four weeks later and you do better. And my plan, which I've suggestion I think will probably happen, if it does happen, probably secret, so I won't be told about it, is to do this with allies. Because it's not much point doing it just in the United States. You need to do it with the Austrians, with the British, and all those offshore territories I mentioned. About. That would send a message to Russia. Now, we don't have to advertise how we did it, but I think it'd be good to advertise that we've done it and what the result was. We had an exercise, and within 48 hours, we freezed $64 billion worth of Russian state assets and assets belonging to friends of Putin. Next time we did it, it was $120 billion. That would send a message very clearly to the Kremlin um, that if you mess with us, we can do stuff you don't like. But there's one danger, and I want to finish up on this because in a way it's the most important point, and then I'll take some questions. One of the dangers is that we deal with the Putinist threat by adopting Putinist tactics. And this really worries me because, and I'll give you a little story to illustrate it, and you can ask yourself what would be the right way to deal with this. There's a Russian spy born in Finland called Timur Kivimagi. Please don't Google it because it will spoil the point of my story. <laughs> uh, Mr. Kivimagi is one of those annoying left-wing Finnish peace researchers, and he got a job in Denmark nothing wrong with that, at the Institute of Military Sciences, which is the kind of main place in Denmark where people study military security, intelligence, and so on. And he was recruited by the Russians. 
to spy on his students. And he was caught. Danish counterintelligence filmed him in a restaurant, a Chinese restaurant in suburban Copenhagen, so glamorous, where he was passing an envelope across the table to a, an SVR officer, Russian foreign intelligence, who in return passed an envelope to him with money in it. Absolutely clearly caught. And in the envelope were lists of his students and the ones he thought might go and work for NATO, the ones he thought might go and work for other countries' intelligence services, what their weaknesses were, you know, full dossier, useful for the Russians. And he lost his job, which was good, and he was prosecuted, which was good, and he was jailed, which was very good, because it's quite hard to go to jail. <laughs> in Denmark, to go to jail, actually I think he was only in jail for a couple of weeks, and then he was under house arrest with a tag, an sort of electronic tag. But still, this was pretty good. This was Denmark, and Denmark, Denmark being tough. And I thought this was a pretty good story. I was quite pleased about that. Then you can imagine how I felt when I found out that Professor T uh, Kivamagi had got a job at a British university. <laughs> After. After, mm -hmm. yeah. He'd gone back to Finland. He was treated as a hero by left-wing Finns, which is fair enough. Um, he claimed that it was all political persecution. He said, if I'd been doing this for the Americans, no one would mind. It's just unfair. It's only because I did it for the Russians. Um, and he had other, other arguments as well. But anyway, he got a job teaching international relations at Bath University. So I was quite cross about this. And luckily, I have a friend who's the head of the chairman of the government. He's the chairman of the governments of Bath University. And so I told him, he went to see his university administrators, and he said, uh, What's going on with this Kiyomagi chap? He's a, he's a Russian spy. And in Britain, if you sleep with your students, you can never teach again. If you spy on them, that's kind of all right. And the administrator said, oh, I'll find out. And he came back and he said, well, I've talked to the International Relations Department and they say that Professor Kiyomagi has very interesting perspective on international relations, very original. Um, his students really like him. Um, there's been no complaints, and he's very productive. He writes all sorts of books and papers and reports. Report. I don't think they were joking. Of course he writes reports. He's been spying for Russians. Okay, so that's the problem. Now just think through, what do you do about that? What is the answer? Because my initial reaction was, I would like MI5 and the police to go to his house at 3 o'clock in the morning, put a black bin, ba bin bag over his head, keep him locked up for a week, and then send him back to Finland. That was my instinctive reaction. I think many of you want the same. And then after, and I thought, well, maybe they should just tell the university to fire him. And then I thought about it a bit more, and I thought, I don't want to live in a society where MI5 tells the Shah Security Service, like the VSD here. I don't want to live in a society where the security service, or indeed the government, tells the university who they can hire and who they must fire. I don't want that. I don't actually want someone to be arrested if they haven't actually broken the law. Now, the fact he did break the law, that's true. Um, if he breaks it again, that's true. I imagine that our security services keep a bit of an eye on him, particularly checks he doesn't go to any Chinese restaurants. <laughs> um, that might be the clue. But I don't want to live in that sort of society where you hand over the problem to the intelligence and security services. Um, I don't want to be in a society where you're told you can't do business with Russia. I don't like it when people do lucrative business with Kremlin cronies, but I don't want to have that banned. I don't want to be in a society where you can't go to court because you're Russian. All the things that the Russians do, unless it's actually a criminal offence, I don't want to have the authorities telling them to stop. Sure, if they're spying, if they're breaking the law, that's fine. But I don't want to have the answer to the Putinist threat being that we Putinize our own societies. And I think that's a real danger. I think it's a danger that we start instinctively reaching for the bad, saying, make that illegal. I don't like that radio station. I don't like that website. I don't like that journalist. I don't like that academic. I don't like that group. I don't like that. I don't like this. Bad. Get the police in. Seals on the doors. Take their property away. Just stop them doing it. Now, sometimes this may be the right thing to do. I'm not saying it's always wrong. But it should be the last resort and not the first resort. So I just want to leave you with that thought, that the great danger I think we face now in the new Cold War is not that Russia just beats us straight off. I think we've woken up to that. I think the real danger is that we Putinize our own societies, and therefore, by doing that, make them weaker. 
and by doing so, actually, the Kremlin will have won, even though we think we've just done the right thing. So on that cheerful note, note of warning, I thank you very much for your attention, and if we have some time for questions, yes. I'd be happy to take them. Uh, so, uh, not one question, but... So, for, politica, for politicians, it's, it's uncomfortable to, to tell things that they have to tell, and to do things sometimes that they have to do. As we told about German politics and another, because they are you know, banned the, the, the corporations that pay for their elections and so on and so on. So, why nobody from uh, another another part like from like from a science society like you and not, do not initiate uh, um, uh, uh, cases? For for crimes against humanity and uh, support, for supporting terrorism for Putin and the gang <coughs> surrounding him, so Lavrov, Sechi, and and all those people, Shoigu, and also, if anybody initiates that like the, those cases, there are people that are in, uh, that they have very bad history about they are they are harmed by them by them yeah. and and they can collect 100% uh, improvements about the about their what they did in Georgia Chechnya Ukraine and so on and so on it, it, it's crimes against uh, against humanity in Aleppo and that's all and those cases can run step by step to the uh, cargo hard yes that's the, that's the first question and the second question is uh, why uh, European uh, politics, uh, European and NATO West politics are, are so soft on the Russia on Russia uh, affairs? Because everybody knows that 50% that they say is lie. Uh, another, all the things, the trolley fabric, and also many things, yep, yep. Uh, uh, they they did harm, financial harm to their societies, democracy, and poli economy also. Yeah. Okay. So why do they are so soft? Why are okay. so soft? Well, there's are two excellent questions. Um, I think that the I didn't mention the Magnitsky sanctions, but I think that's a really promising development. And again, a big thank you to Lithuania for being one of the first countries to adopt these Magnitsky sanctions, because um, these sanctions are targeted against individuals. These are individuals responsible for human rights abuses, particularly the death in custody of Sergei Magnitsky and the theft of money from the Russian taxpayer, which he uncovered. And those are named individuals, and they can't go to the West anymore. They can't have assets in the West. And I think that's absolutely the way to go. You've got to find named individuals and say, because of what you did, you can't come to our countries, you can't have money here. Maybe we should widen it and say your wife, parents, children, can't go, but you, it's very important. Holding individuals accountable, I think, is 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 very is very important. And I am very glad that you know, America was the first, I think, Magnitsky country. Huge opposition from the Obama administration, um, but it went through Congress, overrode um, Obama's veto, um, and then I think 20 something countries have now got Magnitsky sanctions, and the European Parliament is planning to vote them through on on a, on a European level. So it can be done, and the more countries do it, the braver everybody becomes. If you're just one country, then the Russians can try and um, retaliate. Crimes against humanity is difficult because Russia is not a member of the International Criminal Court, and you can only bring people to The Hague if they are members. Now, we do take Russia to the Council of Europe, um, to the European Court of Human Rights, and they lose on a regular basis and pay fines and have to do things. Unfortunately, they're about to pull out of the Council of Europe now, and um, so I suspect that will no longer be open to us. But we have used international human rights law against uh, against Russia on specific cases and we mostly win and that's you know that, that's good we could do it more as to why the West is soft um, generally I think it's it's partly as I said ignorance and partly complacency and partly greed people don't realize for a long time they didn't realize <coughs> what a threat um, Russia was then they realized it was a threat but they thought we could deal with it and they thought oh, it's bad, we're still making money and as I said at the end, the one thing we have not really dealt with is money. 
and money allows Russia tremendous influence in countries like Germany and Italy. Um, they, I think, bought politicians also in other countries as well. Um, the promise of nice jobs when you leave politics is very hard to police. You saw um, not just Mr. Schroeder from uh, Germany getting a job with Gazprom, but then uh, Wolfgang Schussel, the Austrian Chancellor, I think a former Finnish Prime Minister got a nice job. We need to be a lot tougher on that. We need to say to individuals, maybe we can't prohibit you from doing this. And in fact, in Germany, I think it's illegal. And Schroeder was someone trying to prosecute Schroeder for this. What we can say is that your public career is over if you do this. You take a job with a Russian oil or gas company or something like that, you don't get invited anywhere anymore. You don't get to give speeches. You don't get any other normal job in normal society. So I think getting back to what I said earlier, um, it's, you know, the criminal justice system is a very powerful tool, but you can't use it for everything. And social ostracism is a really powerful tool. Um, I often, I got into trouble for this, but when I was at The Economist, one of my jobs was hiring. I, was, I would go through the list of applications and pick out the ones that went on to the next stage. And I said really publicly, if your resume shows you work for Sputnik, or for Russia today, as it was then, RT now, your application won't go any further. I'll put it in a bit. Because working for a state propaganda organization is not the beginning of your journalistic career, it's the end of your journalistic career. And the Russians complained like mad about it. They said, this is KGB tactics. I said, it's fine. You know, if you want to make your career in RT, it's not against the law. Maybe you can move from RT to work for press TV, for the Iranians, and there to the Chinese, and then back. And there's a whole alternative universe out there but it's not respectable journalism. You can also say to people, don't appear on these channels. If they phone you up and ask for a quote, don't give them a quote. If they ask you to come in for an interview, don't go. Don't advertise. So we can use all the, we haven't begun to exploit all the social pressure we have against these things. And I think that, that's, that, that is a really important weapon. So I know the instinctive reaction is, sue them, put them in prison, throw the courts at them, use the legal system, but I don't want to overuse that weapon. I want to get the whole of society involved on this. So it, will, it will last better and be more effective in the long run. Sir? Uh, in your opinion, could Russia in general face some uh, serious internal problems uh, at their own country for taking into consideration that this is not a homogeneous country at all, and also they have quite my neighbors, China, who also could treat some of them territories as China's prostanstvo? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. And I, um, and I think you're, you're absolutely right that um, you know, Russia goes through these cycles of expansion and contraction. We saw 1917, 1991. And I think there's another one coming. Um, the Kremlin doesn't run Russia very well. And one of the things that unites almost everyone from the Russian provinces is that they dislike the fact that Moscow is so rich and everybody else is so poor. Um, so just in plain economic terms, the way the bureaucratic rents are collected from Russia and distributed by the Kremlin, mostly in Moscow, and to the members of the elite is a very unfair and very inefficient business model. And there are lots of very smart um, Russians who long for their country to be, as they put it, normal. They don't want to be from a pariah state. They don't want to be in a country that's run by the KGB or the ex-KGB. They don't like all this nonsense they see on television with Kisilyov and all these people with that kind of fascist propaganda on Sunday evenings. They find this is revolting. And it's frustrating because, they, 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 because it, it keeps them out of the world that they want to live in. So I think there's, there's that kind of pressure. There's the regional pressure. There's ethnic pressure. Um, in particular the North Caucasus, very high birth rates, Russians leaving. The North Caucasus isn't really part of Russia anymore, certainly not Chechnya. The definition of Russia is Russia is where the Kremlin decides what happens and the Russian constitution more or less applies. Well, that doesn't count. That's not Chechnya. Chechnya is Kadyrovistan. And you know, we should be sorry about that for the people who live there, but it's a sign, I think, of, of things to come. Um, so yes, I think there's going to be um, big internal strains. I don't, I don't think we should actively welcome the breakup of Russia because I think it could be very messy and lots of people could get killed and it could be very dangerous. But I would love Russia to change into a more decentralized country 
where Tartars and Mali and uh, English and Chechens and Circassians and Saha and the Buratians and all these other people could actually enjoy the same sort of linguistic and cultural rights that we take for granted here in Lithuania. That would be great. And I would love it if Russia was uh, back in the family of nations as a cultural superpower, which is where it should be historically. Um, so I think we've got to be very cautious, um, very vigilant, uh, ready to help when we can. Um, but we should be careful about, I mean, some people say, let's get on and try and break up Russia. And I think that's not the right way to do it. That's a Nevitsky Slugi, a kiss of, you know, the, the kiss, of, kiss of death, because the Kremlin will come down very hard on people it sees as, as Western-backed separatists. Um, but I would certainly encourage you as Lithuanians, um, do everything you can to be friends with people in Kaliningrad. Every cultural connection, every sporting connection, every person-to-person -person connection. This is really important. It's good for us to develop the idea of the sort of Yevlovsky identity. Um, just because they are part of the Russian Federation, just because they're run by the KGB, just because they've got, they live in the middle of a military camp. That doesn't mean they're not people. They have the same hopes and fears and dreams as we do. We should reach out to them and try, try, try and do everything we can to make them feel part of this sort of, this sort of world. So, the man. The man with the light switch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, Russia was, is, and seems like it will be imperialistic country in the near future. What is your insight concerning democracy in Russia in the next decade? And about impact of EU in this direction? Right. Well, I think one has to be very, I, I mean, history is really important, but it's, history is not always a guide to the future. And I think that there is, you, you're absolutely right, Russia has been an empire since the days of, you, know, you have to go back to Veliky Novgorod to find a sort of <coughs> non-imperialistic um, <coughs> Russian entity. And so, we should, so that's why I said we should always be very cautious. And even if things go right for a bit, that doesn't mean they won't go wrong again. One of the things that worries me is that Putin goes and someone comes in to power, post-Putin guy, and says, I want to be friends. Everything's going to be fine. And the West and me say, phew, thank goodness. And we'll forget everything that we've learned in the last 20 years. So I'm, I'm worried about that. I think whatever happens, we've got serious problems. And I think that Putinism actually predates Putin, and Putinism will outlast Putin. Um, so we need, but I think we also have to be very clear that not all Russians are like that. You know, think of Manchester. Think of Sakharov. Think of the Russians who demonstrated on Red Square against the Soviet-led invasion of Czechoslovakia. Think of the Russians who demonstrated for Lithuania after January the 13th. So I think it's very important that we, we, we are, the Kremlin wants, wants Russians to feel that there's no choice but the Kremlin. They want Russians to feel that the West hates Russia, the West doesn't treat Russia nicely, the West is hostile, that Russia is a besieged fortress, um, and they, they, want to, they want Russians to feel paranoid, to feel unloved, to feel resentful, to feel anti-Western. Because if you make Russians feel like that, then they will support Putin, because there isn't anything else. So the best thing we can do against Putin is to show Russians that we like Russians, it's just Russia we don't like, it's just the regime we don't like. So I think that's why I said it's really important if you have a chance to reach out to people in Kaliningrad, your neighbours, or just Russians generally. Uh, whenever I see Russian tourists in London, I'm always super friendly to them. I say, I'm so glad you came. I, I talk to them in Russian. They're always a bit surprised. Mishest, Mishest. So, no, no, just, just, just I, I lived in Russia. I like Russians. I like Russian culture. I tell them about the Russian cultural exhibitions that are going on. I advise them to go to Pushkin House. Because this is the most powerful anti-Kremlin thing you can do. If you go up to them and say, you're very wicked, you Russians. Get out of Ukraine. You stole Crimea. You never apologized for the occupation. Yeah, they probably won't be very happy. But if you show them that you can be friends, then they're more, you know, it, it, it's the best attack against 
against Putinism. But I think the prospect for, I mean, I'm not optimistic over a 10 year period. I'm probably optimistic over a, a 20 or 30 year period because there's a whole new generation growing up for whom all this Soviet stuff is history. They don't particularly care about this, you know, siege of Leningrad, Yuri Gagarin, Lenin, it's all come some historical blur. What they know is that they like modern life. They like choice and excellence. And they get choice and excellence in their private life. They have nice phones, nice cars, nice holidays. They make decisions about where to study, where to work, where to retire. They're used to choice and excellence in their private life. And they don't get it in the public life. Because when you turn on telly, it's just propaganda, 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 propaganda. And this great after a while. So I think that Putin is gradually turning into a kind of Brezhnev. And we're in a sort of Brezhnev China, Mark II where he becomes, it's still authoritarian, it's still unpleasant, but it's slightly ridiculous. And that gives me hope. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I would like to know about, uh, clearly to know about two sides of this Cold War. Because really, uh, during Soviet Union, it was Soviet Union and all the West. Yeah. Today it is Russia and all the West, still. And if it is like this, then what is the phenomenon of Russia to oppose all the West? Yeah. A huge area and huge developed area. And Russia is not so developed today, yeah. economically. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, if, if I was giving a longer talk, I'd have had spent 10 minutes on what is the West. So I'm glad you've asked the question. Because the, 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 the old Cold War kept the West together. You know, Japan, Europe, United States, Australia, pretty compact. You know, we all worried about the same same things, and now we worry about different things. And you have countries. You know, there's a lot of countries that worry much more about China. No, they can't understand why we worry about Russia because China's a much bigger threat. Um, within Europe, we have a north-south split. We have countries like Hungary, which seem to be much more keen on making money with Russia than doing anything on collective security. So the West is. I don't think there's one West anymore, but I think there are Western countries that worry about Russia. And that's, that's fine by me. We have the Nordic Five, the Baltic Three, Poland, Germany mostly, Netherlands, France mostly, Britain, Canada, North America, and the United States mostly. Um, that, even that bit, leave out the Spanish or the Portuguese or the Italians or the Greeks, that's already a very big lump of money and a very big lump of military power. If you just take, for example, the Nordic Five, the Baltic Three, and Poland, the NBP-8, uh, nine, nine, sorry. Those nine countries alone spend more on defense than Russia does. It's like from 61 billion to 59 billion. Now, admittedly, Russia gets more because it's a poor country, you get more for your money. But on the other hand, Russia has, with that money, they have to run a nuclear program, they have to run a space program, they have to worry about China, they have to try and be a sort of global military power. The NBP-8 only have one job, that's not defending against Germany, it's not defending against Britain, it's just worrying about Russia. So you know, the means are still very much on our side, despite these divisions. But you asked about the European Union, I think that's really important, and I didn't quite answer it. I think the EU is the most important counterweight to Russia. It's more important, I think, actually, than NATO. Because what the EU shows is that life is not a zero-sum game. You know, Russia has this very powerful idea of zero-sum. If I get it, it means you don't have it. They don't really think that there's potential for productive um, cooperation. It's absolutely the heart of the way Putin looks at the world. And what the EU shows is that if everybody cooperates, you bake a much bigger cake than if everybody baked a cake on their own. And with that bigger cake, means everybody gets a bigger slice. And that's a really powerful message um, for, for, for Putin. And he doesn't understand it. There's a great story about this. Um, anyone here remember 2007, when Russia was waging economic war against Poland? Poland Polish meat exports were being banned by Russia on bogus phytosanitary grounds. This is a big hit to the Polish economy. And so the Polish government, my friend Radek Sikorsky, went to see the Germans. And the Germans said, don't worry, we've got this. 
Angela Merkel had just come in. It was 2007, the Samara summit. Because the, the, those days we had a regular EU Russian summit. And Angela Merkel, her first time there as German Chancellor, goes up to Putin and says to Putin in Russia, what's going on with the Polish meat exports? And Putin goes, oh, I am the sanitary, blah, blah, blah. And Merkel said, listen, you mess with Poland, you mess with the EU. You mess with the EU, you mess with Germany. Back off. I think she didn't put it as politely as that. Putin couldn't understand it. Because for him, Germany is like a real country. And the Poles are this kind of, you know, intermection. Why was Germany defending Poland? He couldn't understand it. I'm not sure he ever understood it. But he backed off. <coughs> because he realized that you cannot, as Russia, as a country of 140 million people, you cannot stand up to the EU with 500 million. Your GDP, Russian GDP, is what, 1.3 trillion? EU GDP, something like 20. So just way, way bigger than you are. Don't pick a fight. So I think that is still really important. And, and thanks to Merkel, even now, with all the divisions in the EU, sanctions have stuck. Sanctions on Crimea, sanctions on the invasion of Ukraine. Now we're getting Magnitsky sanctions, some other sanctions. And they've, and they've, they've held. And Putin never believed that was going to happen. Time for one more question? <coughs> yeah, um, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, what I find uh, interesting, Putin is uh, basically looking most of the time towards the West, where at the, in, the, in his back, China is coming in, in big forces. Millions and millions of Chinese moving into Russia. Russian women marrying Chinese men because they don't beat, they don't drink, they bring money home. Can you explain this? Why is he allowing this to happen? Yeah, well, it's interesting. There's, there's, a, there's a big division in the Kremlin between... <coughs> in, so the regime isn't monolithic. Yeah, there's all sorts of divisions. Divisions between the oil people and the gas people, between the people who come from basically from business and the people who come basically from the, um, the Siloviki. And there's also a division about China. And there are people in the Kremlin who are making a lot of money dealing with China. And I think... You know, I can't guarantee this, but what I've heard is that Sechin is kind of the head of the China clan. He gets on very well with the Chinese. Um, there are others who are very worried about China, and they are, and they would like a much tougher stance. And Putin is somewhere in the middle. And I think at the moment, the sort of Russian idea is that they are still able to deal with, with China in a way that doesn't threaten their national interests. They like threatening the West with gas sales to China. You don't want our gas? We'll sell it all to China, then where will you be? That hasn't worked out very well. The, the Vlast Sibiri pipeline that they built to China was a huge investment for the Russians. The Russians basically paid for the pipe. They didn't get a good price for gas. When the ceremonial opening happened, I think Medvedev turned up from the Russian side and the Chinese sent the sort of deputy assistant undersecretary from the energy ministry. It was quite sort of humiliating <laughs> um, to see that. Yeah. So, the, so, so I think the Chinese, I think, have a rather accurate perception of, of Russia. And the Russians, I think, have not got a completely accurate perception of the threat from China. And it's partly because they're sort of obsessed with this anti-Western stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you might well see the next, you might see a future Russian leadership which would say to the West, you're worried about China, we're worried about China. We'll drop all our differences and let's just concentrate on trying to constrain China. And that would be a difficult one for us. I don't know what we've, what we've said about that. Um, so not another one of the sort of next generation threats to think about. <coughs> I doubt it's millions, actually. I, I went to eastern Russia to look, this is when this story first started, there's a little institute in Vladivostok called the Institute for Regional Political Analysis, which is basically a Russian intelligence sort of propaganda unit. And they were saying, Chinese everywhere. So I thought, I'll go and find them. So I went to Irkutsk and said, where are the Chinese? And they said, um, they're in Ulan-Ude, lots of them there. So I went to Ulan-Ude, where are the Chinese? Uh, they're in Vladivostok, lots of them there. They're in Vladivostok, they're Chinese. Where are the Chinese? They're in Bijan, go there. I found a melon farm with some, like 20 Chinese workers there. I said, I'm looking for lots and lots of Chinese. There are there. Habarovs. I went to Habarovs. 
Where are the Chinese? Oh, they're, all, they're in Irkutsk. So I think there's a, this, this threat is talked up a bit. I mean, I think there, there, there are. But I, I, I would like to see some really hard empirical data from people who don't have a vested interest in talking this up as a scare story. Yeah. Well, thank you very much.